I love watching people dance to that music. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, I, it was happened as an ordinary day uh, in the year 2000. People were doing construction in Israel, and there was this cave that they came up upon. And they knew that they couldn't touch the cave because obviously there was something really powerful about it. And they realized they found this limestone cave with a bunch of different rooms inside of it and that they knew was some type of history. In fact, not only the construction workers, but the archaeologists that then came said humanity's history is within these walls. I'm talking about Qasem Cave, which is in Israel. It's this powerful cave uh, that's very large in size. The archaeologists come in and they do uh, different stages of archaeology. It's measuring and mapping, uh, finding artifacts, cleaning the artifacts, and then separating all the artifacts. And they go into this cave and they realize the different rooms, the different conversations that I'm sure were had, and they said, this is history. This thousands and thousands year old cave is representing the history of humanity. And then they noticed that as they're going through their stages, of archaeology, they said, there's something here that seems out of the norm of what we've seen in the past. They actually found this really flat surface that really wasn't really big, but they said there must be a purpose. There's obviously a purpose for this flat surface. And so they studied it and studied it, and they found a thick bed of ash on this really flat surface. I have a picture of it. It's in the right top corner here, but the picture, you see it right in the center here. This is very unique space, almost a perfect kind of rectangle. They started studying it and found layers and layers of ash and bits of bone. And this wasn't just from a bonfire thousands and thousands of years ago. This wasn't just from a barbecue that happened and everyone was there laughing. This was used for the first time as the world's oldest hearth, the first flat top, if you will. People would gather around it while the food was being cooked, and they would sit there and have conversation with one another, and as the food is continually being cooked, and as they're still eating, they're watching the food being cooked, and everyone from out all of the other rooms would be gathering around this figurative table, just like us today. That's why we're in this series called At the Table, because conversations happen at the table. Community happens at the table. Companionship happens at the table. In fact, the word companion comes from two words put together that means bread and community bread together. Right, this is a beautiful idea. So as we look at these few meals with Jesus as he's at the table, there's something that happens at the table. We are, we are experiencing a greater and deeper connection. In fact, the archaeologists go on to write an article that's published in many different areas, National Geographic being one of them, and they would actually tie back to the Bible. They would say, to break bread together, a phrase as old as the Bible captures the power of a meal that forges relationships. Think about the tables that you've been to. Well, this is so true. It, definitely relationships are formed. This is why as little kids, you have tea parties and you play house and you have meals. As kids in elementary school, you go to the playground and you trade snacks. Or well, if you're like me, you sold snacks when you were in elementary school. But you have food together, you eat together, you laugh together, you shed tears, you celebrate the things that are happening. On your birthday, people make cake or pie, which is so much better. Why are we still eating cake? You know, whatever. You have this opportunity at the table for something to happen. Amazing opportunity for God to move. Think of some of the most important conversations you've had. Maybe it was a business deal that was done in the, in the presence of a conference table. Maybe a golf course as well, but then a table somewhere. Or maybe that first date was probably at a meal. Or maybe some of the most difficult conversations you've had have been at tables. There's something about a table. And as we look at what Jesus does at the presence of a table and the presence of a meal, we realize he takes the mundane and makes it miraculous. When I think of the Qasem cave, which is thousands of years old, I wonder what they talked about. See, this is what have been before was built before Jesus walked the earth. I wonder what they talked about. Maybe they talked about the coming Messiah. Maybe they talked about Jesus. Maybe they said, maybe one day he will come and he'll set everything right. Maybe they talked about a moment where people could gather from different backgrounds, different cultures, to gather in a place like this, worship God together, and speak the name of Jesus without risk of someone coming in and saying, you can't do that anymore. Maybe they were hoping for the day that you and I call common. Maybe they were wondering what would happen if Jesus... The Messiah, the chosen one, really did walk in the room. This is what I believe maybe they were talking about. In fact, in the book of Luke, we're going to look at some of those conversations. If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 5, to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, right before the book of John. It's part of what we call the synoptic gospels that are a synopsis of the life of Jesus, Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke. 
And you'll see in, in Luke chapter 5, some great things are happening. In fact, uh, theologians who study the book of Mark, they will say this, that Jesus is always at a meal, going to a meal, or leaving a meal in the book of Luke. Because Jesus liked to eat. In fact, Jesus says in Luke chapter 7, I believe it's verse 34, he says, the Son of Man came to, the Son of Man has come, think about what we would put in there, uh, to save the world, to die for our sins, which yes, he did, uh, to, conquer, to conquer death in the grave, yes, of course. Jesus himself says, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. Jesus enjoyed eating. He liked the party. That's the kind of Jesus I want to serve. So in Luke chapter 5, we get to see another moment when Jesus arrives for a meal. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 27. After this, whenever you see an after this, we have to know what came, what was already before there. Well, Jesus just healed a leper and a paralytic. So you have to know news is traveling fast. Uh, we live in a place called Tierra Santa. That's where our campus is. Um, and it's a really small community. And if anything happens, uh, everyone knows about it immediately. It's on next door. It's on Facebook. It's somewhere. If, if your car got broken into, we all know about it already. It just happens. That was the type of small town it was. A leper and a paralytic got healed. And everyone knew that this man Jesus is walking around doing miracles. So I'm sure people are crowding him. People are yelling. People are wondering who he is. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector, by the name of Levi. Levi, that, that name comes from uh, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, so Levi probably came from that tribe. And Levi maybe wanted to be like the Levites. Levites actually cared for all of the things that were happening in uh, the church at that time, uh, making sure everything was holy, making everything was right um, in the presence of God. And so maybe he wanted to be a Levite. Maybe he even wanted to be a rabbi at one time. However, he was at a place where maybe people said, you're not good enough to be one, where he said, all I know how to do is collect taxes. So Jesus sees this tax collector, and you have to know tax collectors are not like you think today, like the IRS. Tax collectors were extremely corrupt, um, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But Jesus walks up to a tax collector, and he says, follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi had a great banquet for Jesus at his house. That's just wild. Imagine Jesus coming over to your home. A great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Yes, they just said the tax collectors are sinners. Because in that time, tax collectors were in the same uh, kind of category as murderers, robbers, and tax collectors. Can you imagine being an accountant, CPA, uh, tax collector at that time? Be like, who should we free, the murderer or the tax collector? Uh, I just collect taxes, man. I didn't hurt anybody. Stole some things, but I didn't hurt anybody. Verse 30. But the Pharisees, the teachers, they complained. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? 31. Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, only the way Jesus could answer. Then he goes on, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, the Pharisees see this moment and they're missing what Jesus is trying to show them. Jesus is saying, you're missing what is happening at the table. That's what we need to ask today. What is happening at the table? The truth is, Jesus shares his heart at the table. He goes to the edge of society. He will, he will go beyond physical, social, and economical status. And he will break every single line that anyone has set, any place of separation. He will shout from the rooftops, removing the shame and imparting a simple truth that there is a seat for you at the table. I believe that's good. If we're going to clap for that, God is good. That's powerful. There's a seat for you at the table. And this is based on Jesus' own observation, not the persuasion of anyone else. He walks up to a tax collector. You may be thinking, well, I'm not a tax collector. Well, the truth is there's a seat for you at the table because it doesn't matter what they have said. They. And you know who they are. You know that, that, that people group or, or that person or that friend that is no longer a friend anymore has said about you. It doesn't matter what they have said. All that matters is what Jesus is saying. No matter what they have said, Jesus walks up and he says, follow me. There's a seat for you at the table. And all throughout scripture, from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, you see Jesus finding and God finding the people that others have crossed out and he highlights them. We shouldn't even know Levi. But Jesus says, everyone crossed him out. Everyone said he should be forgotten and put away. But I'm going to highlight him. And you're going to know 
who this person's name is, and you're gonna know the power that happened after I said, follow me, because he's highlighting people. And that's what he does for you and me every single day. He highlights you when we feel like we're just filled with shame, when we feel like there's no way that we should uh, live another day or, or breathe another breath. He says, I wanna highlight you in this situation because God wants to do the miraculous. This is why he says, after this, Jesus went and he finds this tax collector. He sees him. That word saw in the Greek means he paid careful attention. He probably saw Levi in other areas multiple times. Uh, They maybe passed, cross paths with one another. Jesus knew the type of tax collector Levi was. He had probably seen him steal before. And Jesus at this moment says, regardless of all of that, follow me. You see, we have to know how tax collectors work at this time. Uh, there was heavy Roman rule. And so where uh, there was Roman rule, that meant there was often oppression. And so if you lived in Rome, you didn't have to pay taxes. Uh, however, if you lived in the other areas that Roman rule was really oppressing, you had to pay these taxes. And so the Romans would come in and say, hey, um, this area needs to be taxed uh, $300,000. For our sake, we'll just say that number. $300,000. Then there'd be a bidding war between tax collectors. 300, I'll do 350,000. Someone, I'll do 340,000. I'll do 360, whatever. Somehow, Levi won the bidding war. Maybe he said $375,000. I can do that. And then what would happen is, Levi would have to make a living. And so, they didn't just give the 375,000 to the Romans. They said, well, I'm going to charge more for everyone. And so they'd have a sheet of paper that only they were privy to. And as people would walk up to their tax booth, they would say, all right, Marcus, you owe, it's written $150, you owe $2,037. Can I see that paper? You're not privy to that information. And you have to pay it. And if you don't pay it, there's a Roman guard sitting next to you that's ready to do whatever he needs to do. And if you don't want to pay it, we'll actually force you into slavery. And you need to pay it. And they would say, but Levi, aren't you, aren't you Jewish? Aren't you one of us? And you say, I am one of you, but I have a job and I need to do my job. And they say, all the money that you're stealing from us is really hurting our families. And Levi would say, it really doesn't matter because you're going to have to pay it anyways. Robbers, murderers, and tax collectors. They were thieves who were stealing from their own people. That's why they were so despised. And Jesus walks up and says two words, follow me. Which is mind-blowing because at the time, uh, typical rabbis would have people walk up to them and say, you're, you're so good at what you do. You know the law. You know the Torah. You know the scriptures. I want to follow you. Will you let me follow you? And Jesus says, no, I am the law and the scriptures. I am everything that you could ever desire. So I will go up to you and say, you follow me. So Levi has to do something. That, that word, follow me, as you read it in Greek, is a really beautiful word. It's akalutheo. Uh, it actually means follow me, like in step with your body, but also in your behavior. So Levi has to make some type of response. Jesus just said, follow me. This person who I heard is healing lepers and paralytics. Why would he say, follow me? This tax collector, this person who has no right in being in this area, what is, what is my response to something like this? Well, Levi got up and left everything and followed him. You have to think about the tax booth for a moment. Think about the dirt road probably leading up to the tax booth. Uh, Matthew, uh, we know his name is Matthew because he's one of the disciples and that's how his name is recorded. Uh, Levi, he probably had two names, Levi and Matthew. Like he may have a nickname or like a a surname and and, and a married name, whatever it may be. Um, Levi and Matthew. Levi probably walks to the tax booth on the dirt road dressed in very nice clothes because he had more money than many people around him. And he walks on this dirt road and he would go into the tax booth that was lifted up a little higher because he needed to look down on people as they would walk up and say, could I just get a little, little relaxation on my taxes? I, I just can't do it right now. The family needs to eat. I, I have people who are sick. Tax collectors were often known to say, well, let them die. And so he had this status. He had comfort inside of this tax booth. There was probably an open window and areas for him to get some type of air and a beautiful look. And he was protected in this tax booth because there were Roman guards on either side of it. He always had the protection. There was bars blocking from anyone throwing something at the tax booth. Maybe he'd get a little spit on him, but he would just pick up a crazy crimson piece of cloth that cost more than anything else anyone could ever imagine. And he would just wipe it on his face and throw it in the trash. But as a tax collector, you had everything. You had comfort, you had convenience, you had security. You had identity. It was probably all Levi knew. Think about the things that are all we know. And I love that this tax collector sitting at the tax booth. He's sitting and waiting 
to receive some money. Little did he know the unexpected was coming. He would get to experience the Messiah. How many of us are sitting and waiting for what we expect and not ready to experience the unexpected so that we would get the opportunity to leave everything and follow him? Leave everything, follow one thing to experience everything you could ever imagine. I think of what would be inside of the tax booth. As I said, of course, it'd be just beautiful, probably on the inside, but there's also a lot of money inside of the tax booth. The text doesn't say that he grabbed the money that was there that he made that day and walked off. No, he left everything. Everything. He, He probably had the clothes he was wearing and walked out. Getting ready for the Roman guards to to say something to him, to say, you're not going to make any money for us again. You have to leave everything. Jesus called many disciples, uh, 12 of them that we have recorded in scriptures, and and it's not as if the tax collector is is necessarily on the same uh, level as the fishermen. The fishermen, as they left to being a fisherman, they could essentially go back to be fishermen. But as a tax collector, you ruined relationships. So you'll, you'll never go back to that job again. Levi said, I'm willing to leave everything. And follow the one thing. Again, everything I've ever wanted. And Jesus invites us to do the same. To leave our tax booth for something better. And well, I really don't have a tax booth. Every new season has a new tax booth. Maybe it's your calendar. God forbid something happened and something needs to change your schedule. I know who you are. Right? Or your finances. Nope, I have it set up and everything is going this way. And then, and then the car breaks down. Oh, and then... Everything goes through our heads. God, where are you? You're not taking care of anything. And he goes, no, I'm trying to show you something, trying to teach you something in this stressful moment. Right? Or, or you're getting ready to, to go into this new job and this career is so safe for you and so comforting and you have a status and people call you by a certain title and everything is so great. And God said, would you leave that to go and share about me somewhere else? But God, no, it's my career. That's my security. Maybe for you it's comfort. And I'm going to be honest, sometimes that can be me. Uh, I kind of like being comfortable. I don't like being too dirty. I wash my hands all the time. Many of you know, know why, right? Uh, I like to be very clean. Um, but but God, get out of my comfort zone, go on a mission trip? <laughs> I don't know, God. Like, this tax booth is nice, right? I, I, I do my nine to five, and yeah, it's more than 40 hours. You know, it's probably like 60 hours. By the way, that's uh, a study came out a couple years ago. That's most of San Diego. We all work over 60 hours a week. We work too much. But God, this is comfortable. I know what's going to happen. But if I get on that missions trip, I mean, then I don't know. And someone's going to have to lead. I'm going to a place I've never been before. He goes, exactly. I get a little comfortable. God, I don't want to get too dirty. God, go talk to that person. Go share my faith with those people. But they know what I used to be like. He says, leave it for something better. Maybe it's that addiction that you just can't kick. And you're saying, you know, one day I'll be able to stop. He says, leave that. I know it makes you feel comfortable. It makes you feel like you have complete security. It makes you feel like you have complete sanity. It makes you feel like you have complete hope. But it is all false and it will all fail. Follow me. Levi walked away from anything that would compete with Jesus. And Jesus says, are you willing to do the same? He said, well, I, Marcus, I, I would do it. But if Jesus were to walk up to me and say, would you follow me? I'd, I'd have to say, you don't know how bad I am, Jesus. Yes, he does. Just like he saw Matthew means he paired he, paid very close attention to, he pays very close attention to you. He knows how bad we can be and he knows how right he can make us. So he says, follow me and I'll help you. Think, but the things that I've done, it's either too late or it's too soon. And, I, and if, I, if I start now, I'm just gonna be the same person that I am. Well, the best news is in the kingdom of God, the way we start doesn't have to be the way that we end up. So you can start today because what happened for Levi, he went from stealing to freeing people. He went from finding people to following Jesus. He went from fighting over money to inviting people to a meal. That's why you see he invited Jesus for a banquet, but there were other people around them. You see that word banquet means reception, uh, to receive something. Levi said, I received something that I can't help but share. Where are my friends at? So he invited his friends. Think about how awkward that would have been. The tax collectors coming in, speaking tax collector talk. You know they probably said some words. And Jesus being right there, Levi being like, guys, don't embarrass me. Don't embarrass me. Jesus is at the table. Imagine if Jesus came to your house. Do you clean? He knows you didn't clean until you knew he was coming. Like, 
Do you tell the kids to be on their best behavior? And then they ask you, but I thought God knows everything. You're like, you're right. So they know how bad you are at times. Okay. Uh, Do you ask him to do the dishes because he could get it done in two seconds? Do you have him cook? You know, what do you do? Just imagine him coming over to your house. But as he's at the house, the tax collectors and the other people are there. And they're all wondering, why are we here? You see, in ancient Near Eastern culture, when there was something really good that happened, and maybe it was a a raise in your finances, maybe a a birth was coming, whatever it was, you would hold a huge banquet. And it's not like we do in Western culture. What happens is when we get a raise, we get a bigger house. What happens is when you got a raise back then, you would get a bigger table and invite more people to come. You would, in fact, have three times the amount of food so people could eat their fill, and you could say, all I want to do with the money that I've been given is to bless the people around me. How different it is than today. So he says, I want you to come in and be at this table. And I love that as we read uh, this, this scripture, we realize that Levi really didn't say much. Levi was probably like, hey, everyone just come in. And for the tax collectors, it was a place to be. For the religious people, it was a place to avoid. Everyone comes in, and Levi was like, Jesus, do your thing. Go ahead. Tax collectors were like, hey, so all the blah, blah, blah. And Levi was just like, Jesus, I know you have an answer for that one. Go ahead. And they're saying some words, you know, maybe that Levi feels like we shouldn't say anymore. Levi kind of looks at Jesus, and Jesus doesn't even say a word. And Levi's like, I don't get this guy. Jesus is sitting there at the table. Levi just wants to introduce. But what happens is at times we feel like our table is just for us. We say it's just me and Jesus. No one else at the table. Because if other people really knew how bad I was, and then what I'm trying to be like now, man, that could really ruin my reputation. I could really change how people see me. And that's the point. Because the truth is, we have to be like Levi in the story and value building relationships over preserving reputations. At the end of the day, if we want to build relationship with the people around us and the God who died for us, we have to say, come to the table. Everyone. But what happens is so many of us, we say yes to Jesus, and then uh, we leave a life of sin and forget those who are still struggling. In fact, studies have shown that the greatest years of witnessing and evangelism in our lives is is the two years years beginning from when we say yes to Jesus until two years, and then we just stop. We stop telling people about Jesus at that time. Why? Because we want to isolate. Maybe for, for two different reasons. Maybe for one, that we're afraid that people will think something. Uh, Or two, we're afraid that maybe the unholy will get on us and we'll become unholy again. This is how it was for the Pharisees. Because the economic status of Levi changed. And the relational status of Levi changed because he had a relationship with Jesus at this point. But his reputation remained the same. And you may be thinking, well, when I tell people about uh, about Jesus, I mean, it gets a little awkward at times. and, And it does. I feel like, I feel like if, there was, if there was a verse that, that we could read, and there's so many that tell us, just continue to tell people and make disciples. Be disciples who make disciples. Just do that. And you're not teaching them to follow you. And guess what? We all will mess up. But Jesus, perfect. They're not here to follow you. They're here to follow Jesus. Show them who Jesus is and watch what happens. You're like, well, I just don't have the words to say. Levi said nothing. Jesus, go ahead. Tell them. Tell them what you told me. Tell them what you told me. And they'd be like, Levi, well, how do, you, how do you kind of understand and contextualize and make sure? Jesus has all the answers. I don't. I don't know. All I know is I left everything. I have no money at this point. I have what I had with me. That's it. Well, I don't have the words to say. Well, join us on a serve challenge. We talked about that earlier. Go and serve people. Show them the love of Jesus and watch what can happen. Build relationships. Don't try to preserve a reputation. Because although everything changed for Levi, his reputation remained. So the Pharisees are standing on the outside. They start complaining. I feel like maybe they were jealous because they weren't invited to the party. They knew that the kingdom of God was going to be a party. They didn't have a problem with that. What they had a complaint about and objection to was the guest list. They said, hey God, I know you're all about partying, but with those people? No. They'd say the same thing if they walked into, into this church. Like, you guys? (laughs) No, you guys aren't perfect enough. See, for the Pharisees, they're part of this religious sect that really held uh, really close to the law and even added some of their own at times. Uh, They would 
They would do everything, uh, like even more than was ever asked of them, and not to like share more love with God with others. It was actually to really promote themselves. In fact, the word Pharisee actually comes from a word that means separate. It actually means separatist. So they wanted to be separatists. We wanted to be so holy that we are just apart from the unholy people because we don't want the unholy to get on us so we get dirty. And Jesus says, you're totally missing the point. So what they would have seen is Levi's house that probably had some type of a courtyard and portico because they weren't invited. So they would look over the walls and just be like, uh, Jesus is with... He's with some sinners. As I said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? I love, as I said, in Luke chapter 7, Jesus says, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. They essentially said, hey, Jesus, why are these people just like you? And he said, now you're starting to get it. They are just like me. But they're looking over, wondering why they're not invited, upset because the conversations that are having at the table is more than conversation. It's becoming transformation. And the tough part is, when we get so religious that we feel like we don't need a God because we are God, we have difficulty understanding that God invites all of us to the table. And we have to get to a point where we can fully grasp that no matter how messy we are, Jesus welcomes us to the table. In fact, he doesn't just welcome us, he sits with us in our mess and meets us in our mess so he can bring healing in our hurt. Everyone at that table had the same exact need, a savior. Everyone. And what he does is, is he says, I'm willing to, to be in this mess because the truth is, which I believe he wants to tell all of us today, is that your ability to, to mess things up is nothing compared to God's ability to fix things up. God is so able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine, as it says in Ephesians, that, that he says, you think that is a mess for me? Have you ever seen a kid when they drop something and it's like, hell broke loose? You're like, oh my gosh! And you're like, it's fine. Like, here's a mop. Look, it's gone. We're good. That's Jesus with our mess. He goes, so oh, <laughs> we, can, we can work on that. Follow me in body, but also in behavior. You think, but the religious people are on the outside saying, but why Levi? Maybe you're thinking, why me? You see, that's often because messy people realize that I have to depend on the sustaining power of God and himself because I can't do it alone. That's why all throughout scripture, God chooses unlikely heroes. You and I would not pick the disciples. We wouldn't. you would be like, who is the most educated? Uh, the disciples would be like, uh, we really didn't do that school thing. Um, okay, well, kind of who's like, who's, who's the wisest among the bunch? I know I catch some fish. No, like, okay, if we're really going to start, like, this, this brigade, and we're really going to go in and, and turn Rome upside down, who's the warrior? Uh, pfft, I, don't, I don't know if we have much of that. <laughs> we wouldn't pick them. We'd find some business people and hope that they could do it. And Jesus says, no, I want the people that are willing to say, I am broken without Jesus. Not the ones that say, I believe I am God, therefore I don't need one. This is why when, when the Pharisees ask, hey, so why are you eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Not just the others, as Luke recorded it. Uh, they said tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus responds, the only way that he can respond, he said it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Uh, when, when, he asked, when he asked Levi to follow him, that word actually has this beautiful uh, meaning underlining it. It actually means to, to walk with me and be healed with me. It's like I was told growing up, walk it off, but in the best way. Walk it off. The mess, the pain, the shame, the difficulty, the things that you used to do, the person you feel like you used to be, and follow me as I will heal you into the person that you're meant to be. Walk with him. Then he says, not the healthy, but the sick. And that word sick means those who are severely evil and in desperate need. We would never consider ourselves that, but that's what Jesus came for. He said, are we in that place where God, I know me, and I know left to my own vices, I'm a mess. But God, I'm in desperate need of you. And he says, that's who I'm looking for. Because at that point, he turns the dinner table into an operation table, and he starts to work on our hearts and transform our lives, and everything begins to change. He does soul surgery within us, and we start to look different and act different and sound different and look different. It's a powerful moment in our lives when Jesus says, at the table, everything begins to change. 
Because the gospel is not for people that think they are good. It's for people that know they are bad. And Jesus says, perfect. Watch me change everything. And you're like, well, will he accept me just as I am? Yes, and he won't keep you that way. I'd say that Jesus sees us as we are, loves us as we are, accepts us as we are. And by his grace, he does not leave us as we are. Because Jesus seeks to save and heal and perfect our humanity in need. Versus humanity that says, I'm good, I don't need anything. He can change us for the better. But the truth is, some of us have been like, yeah, we've met Jesus before and nothing really changed. I have, I have good news. If you've met Jesus and nothing changed, you didn't meet Jesus, we simply became religious. Everything changes when we meet Jesus. Everything. Everything. Well, well like it's, is it going to happen right at one moment? Not always. Sometimes it takes years and years and years. Well, I just want it to happen. I know. But God is God and we're not. And thank God that I'm not God. So I'm going to let him do the work that only he can do. Once you meet Jesus, once you're at the table with Jesus, everything begins to change. And again, if it didn't, you haven't met him. You haven't let him in. We maybe just became religious and did a couple things that make us feel holy. But Jesus has a response to that. I've said it before. If Jesus ever breaks out into a sermon after you ask him a question when you're reading scripture, you messed up. And that's what happens here. In verse 33, this is the Pharisees. They're still talking. After Jesus said, it's not the healthy, but the sick who need a doctor, the Pharisees say, okay, we got more to say. And Jesus goes, <laughs> I can imagine him just grabbing his utensils. There weren't utensils. Uh, you know, just being like, all right, let's sit back. Everyone, hold on the food. Hold on the food. Have the bread in his mouth. Just, nope. Get that. Grab a little. Keep talking. Go ahead. This is what they said. John's disciples often fast and pray, and, do the, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Again, they're just like you. And Jesus says, yep. What's your question? Jesus answered, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? Uh, the word bridegroom, we have to fully understand. Bridegroom is the, the one who is coming to receive the bride. Jesus is sitting at the table and he is telling the religious leaders and he's telling those who are at the table, the others, he's saying, I am the bridegroom. I had made my journey because at that time they would do a one week journey where it would be this celebration where the bridegroom and his family would be walking to the bride and they'd be walking and waiting and it'd be a celebration and once they finally met together, they would get to the table, they'd have a celebration celebration and everyone would be eating. Jesus said, you've been waiting for years and years and years. The bridegroom is here. Why would you fast? Some of us have missed it. And he goes on, he says, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they'll fast. You see, Jesus is talking about uh, we actually began the Lent season on Ash Wednesday, which was last week, and then uh, this is the first Sunday in Lent, leading up uh, 40 days to uh, the crucifixion, and then Easter. Jesus is foreshadowing what's going to happen. So I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to die a gruesome death on a cross, be resurrected, and then ascend. And you're going to wish that you were still at this table. Don't miss it. Then he told a parable. Again, he breaks out into a sermon. They messed up. He said, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours out new wine into old wineskin. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. You see, they're, they're talking about the wineskins. Wineskins were actually made from... Uh, sheeps or goat and the neck of the animal was actually used as like the neck of the wineskin and you would pour new wine into a wineskin but if it was an old wineskin it would, was already expanded and at that point it became a little brittle and as you pour new wine into an old wineskin that wine begins to be fermented after all of that hard work of harvesting and smushing all the grapes to get this beautiful liquid it goes into there and as it starts to expand the old wineskin can't keep it in, so it starts to burst and it starts to rip and all the wine, all of your hard labor falls on the ground and it's wasted. Jesus is saying, I'm doing a new thing and it's gonna be a waste if you miss it. How many of us have been stuck in the old ways and missing the new thing that God wants to do in our lives? God, I just love the comfort of my tax booth. God, well, if it were really you, you'd look like this. And he goes, you're missing it. 
He goes on. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. The old way is better. The old me is better. I kind of prefer the old thing, God. I, I prefer when I had those friends and I had those relationships and I got to do whatever I wanted. I prefer that type of thing. And he says, what a waste. Because when you're at the table with Jesus, something new begins to happen. But sadly, at times, we miss it. I don't know where our eyes go. I don't know where our focus is. But he's saying, you're missing the new thing that I'm doing. Isaiah 43, 19. Hey, you don't have to go there in your Bibles, but maybe take a note, write it down. It's a powerful verse. Uh, God is speaking, and he says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Making paths in the wilderness and streams in the desert. God is saying, I'm willing to do something new, but your eyes are focused on everything else but me, so you're missing the new thing that I'm doing. I've talked to so many of you sharing about how something is just, God is doing something in you. You heard it with our baptisms. Uh, They're feeling alive again, feeling like it's this season of surrender where you're letting go but receiving everything at the same time. It makes no sense and it doesn't have to because God is that good. Finally feeling alive. Maybe you need that. That was probably what Levi felt as he left everything, everything that he felt so secure in. And Jesus said, you finally get it. See, when it comes to life, In the New Testament in Greek, there's two words. Um, One is bios, which means pretty much just your existence, your biological existence. And then there's zoe, which means like the fullness of life. Life that is even greater than life. That's the life that Levi was able to receive by responding to the call, follow me. I want that full life. And I remember when I gave my life to Jesus, I needed that full of life. I remember a Billy Graham crusade in 2004. I've shared this story many times at the Rose Bowl. Hearing that Jesus loved me. First time I heard it. Grew up in church, never knew that Jesus could love you. Jesus loved me. And there's nothing I can do to change that. Yes, but you have to receive it. Jesus wants us at his table. He wants to offer us a meal. And he wants us to crowd the kingdom with others just like you and me. Others who are in desperate need of a savior. In fact, last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, Jesus shares this. He says, behold, I'm standing at a door and knocking. In Revelation chapter chapter three, sorry. Revelation chapter three. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. Are you ready to join me at the table? I'm standing at the door and knocking. Are you ready to join me? Uh, That word stands, he's arrived at the place and then he says he's knocking. And it's not just a knock. That word knock means he's willing to strike the door down. Is anyone going to listen? He's willing to do whatever it takes. He's willing to push through all of, all of the mess, all of the muck, all of the pain, all of the shame you may be feeling, all of the regret. He said, I'll push past all of it. It doesn't matter. Just let me in. If you hear my voice and you open the door, I'll come in and I'll eat with you. I want to have a meal with you. He's speaking not only of a future kingdom, but he's speaking of something we can experience now eating with Jesus, consuming what Jesus is consuming, experiencing all that he has for us. But I'm breaking down the door. Would you just let me in? He's speaking to the church of Laodicea at this time and because they've, they've kind of closed off. They've essentially changed the locks of their heart, hoping that Jesus would never come by again. And if there are any windows, they're all closed up. And maybe for us, we've done that. And we've said, God, you, you, can't, you can't come in. I don't want you in anywhere in my life. Maybe it's because you've been angry with God about something that you feel that he did. Maybe there's just confusion. Maybe you just have questions and no one's been willing to answer. We have an entire pastoral team that would love to talk with you. Maybe for you, you're like, no, God's in my heart, but there's certain rooms I don't let him in. He said, I'll break down any door in the house. But would you let me in? That word, anyone hears my voice. It's not just, it's not plural, it's also Singular, like if someone were to just hear me. I'll do a whole banquet for one person. That's how much God cares about you. He says, I'll arrive, we'll have reception together, we'll celebrate together, we'll eat together. But you have to let me in. Some of us have been so closed off that he's been knocking and we've been ignoring him. It's time to let him back in. If you're invited to the table today, how will we respond? I want to pray for those of us that want to let God back in or in for the first time. If you just close your eyes for a moment. God, we believe that you are knocking. 
that you are striking the door, that you're trying to get the attention. Uh, it's like a, like a kid banging on the bathroom door of the, mom, of, of, the, of the restroom when their mom's in there. Mom, come in. Let me come in. God, you want to come in. You want to be invited in. So God, we want to open our hearts to you. And God, we repent now for changing locks, for pushing you out. We ask God that you would be invited in. Still, with your eyes closed, if you're in the room today, watching online, out on the patio, if you're saying, you know, I just need to let him in or let him back in. Because I feel like I maybe haven't met Jesus if nothing's changed. I want everything to change in my life if it's going to be for the better. I want to let him in. If that's you, would you just lift your hand? We just want to pray with you and connect with you after service. Give you tools. See your hand. Even online, you can just type in open door. I see your hands over here. I see your hands. He's knocking and he wants to open the door. He says there's going to be a bunch of food and there's going to be plenty of grace, but everything has to change after this moment. So God, we come before you. We let you in into every area of our heart, every area of our lives, anything that we've been hiding, anything that we've been keeping. We give you full access. We give you full authority over our lives to be changed forever. We need you and we invite you in so we can experience joy with you. If you would just repeat after me very quickly, I open the door. God, that's what we pray. In your name, amen. Give God a hand because we serve an amazing God. He's ready for us. Um, when you came in, you should have received a card that said, prayerfully consider who you can invite to the table. Not just on a Sunday morning uh, to church, but maybe to your house. Maybe just to have a meal, share a meal with them. Who will you invite? To the table. And my favorite way to invite people to church on Sundays is say, can I take you to church on a Sunday? Or take you to lunch on a Sunday? They say, yeah, of course. I said, perfect. We got to make a stop first. Where are we going? Oh, don't worry. It's just a little, little, little cool spot. We're leading up to Easter. People are more ready now searching for hope. And all they're asking for is to be invited to the table. There's a seat for them. So you can fill out that card. Let it be people you're praying for. Maybe you know someone you can just text right now. Hey, can we get lunch, coffee, dinner, whatever it may be? They need an invitation because they're ready to hear from the Messiah that they are loved and they are seen and they've been chosen by God. So I want to pray for your people that you may know. God, we just cover anyone that we're going to write on these cards, our friends, our family members, our coworkers. God, that they would be invited to the table. They would be changed forever and you would receive all of the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, church. God is good.